Welcome again to this edition of Sabbath School Lesson Study, uh, this quarterly that says God's mission, uh, our mission. And uh, with me again this morning are my panelists, um, Masi. Masi, you well? Yes, I'm well you this morning. You want to morning. say hi to the congregation? Yes, God is good. All and time. all the time. The Lord is good as his nature. Yeah, I'm happy to be here once again. Let's join together as we go through the lesson of this week. Karibu sana. Thank you. Uh, I have Maurice with me again, uh, our great panelist in here. Maurice, everything is well with you? Yes, all is well. God is good. All the time. And all the time. The Lord, the Lord is, is good. good. You're all welcome. Thank you. And finally, I have a peer uh, with us. And today he, is, uh, he, is, he, is, he looks like a king. A peer. Go ahead. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Uh, my name is uh, Frank Capio, and uh, welcome as we share God's word this morning. Thank you so much. And I would like to extend a special invitation then to our online viewership that you join with us um, in this lesson study as we reflect and as we uh, get into uh, our study today. And um, just like last week and the previous lesson, lesson four, there were fundamental uh, things and items that we drew uh, into um, uh, appeal. And one of them was uh, Abraham. And we examined Abraham extensively. His mission, his sharing of the mission, we came to the destruction of Sodom and the intercession uh, that Abraham had. And that we uh, got to a good point where we learned that God wasn't going to do anything unless he had shared with, with, with these servants. And we, we picked a little bit of some lessons, didn't we, yes. uh, up here? And in that lesson, right? Yes, we understood that Abraham submitted himself to God. And so in a, in a way, God also invited him to share, you know, in the, in the, in the work. And God invites him to, to pray for, you know, like uh, those that he's going out to and he's reaching out to. And we see God revealing, you know, his purposes to his servant Abraham because of his submission and his obedience. And also, God had seen something that he could use uh, in Abraham to reach out to his people. And that is his hospitality and his love for those that are Absolutely. in sin. Absolutely. And mercy, then there was the entire uh, um, conclusion that God cannot use us until we submit to him, right? Yes, yes. Submission is a very key point that we need to humble ourselves and to be ready to be used of God because God calls us as we are and he will make us fit to use because we know that this service that we are on is not ours, but it is God's. And so everything that we do, let's always commit it into the, into the hands of the God because the Lord is able to use us for a mighty purpose of winning souls for his kingdom. Amen, amen. And Maurice, who I think, again, we went to the concept of love and we saw that without love, all our mission fails immediately. Yes, and we, we actually delved into Christ's, um, you know, uh, statement when he said, a new commandment I give unto you, uh, the commandment of love. And we saw that Abraham was actually actuated by love. It is love that pushed him to go out instead of as a rich and wealthy man right. loved by God. Instead of just sitting down and enjoying his wealth, he was always looking out for the good of the neighbors and for the good of the strangers who were always passing by. And that was love. Very good. So absolutely. So And so today's lesson focuses on the excuses that we, that we can have uh, for, to avoid mission. And there are a myriad of excuses that we, that we can have. And we said that conclusively we have drawn a bigger understanding of how Christ works with us, especially when he wants to use us. And what we know now uh, from this lesson, and I want us to go to our key text, which is in Isaiah uh, 6, verses 8. Isaiah 6, verses 8, that says that, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go? Um, do you want to read it for us, Apio, uh, probably out of your version? Yeah, it says, also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me 
O oh Lord. Here am I, send me, Lord. Oh. And you see, um, just to put this into context, yeah. we are seeing a God who is saying that I had a, a voice asking, whom shall I send? Yeah. Very fundamental. Uh, God himself, through the prophet Isaiah, speaking to us and saying that, whom shall I? Whom, uh, whom shall I send? Whom shall I send uh, to go for us? Yeah. And actually, the, what was interesting for me is that uh, in that very, very verse, the word us is uh, capitalized. Is, uh, he, he, he is asking, mm. right? Uh, Morris, Morris mm. um, help us out uh, there a little bit to, to put this, this key text uh, into, into context. context. Yeah. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah. this, this is one of the very interesting passages of the Bible because um, the opening uh, of the chapter of chapter 6, you realize that Isaiah is taken into a vision. Right. But just to give us more context, I'll take a few minutes, uh, or maybe a few seconds, if God wills. Right. Um, from Isaiah chapter 1 to chapter 5, right. we see a very accusative Isaiah. Right. A very a finger-pointing kind yes. of a prophet. A harsh one. Yes. Woe unto you, daughters of Zion, who call good evil and evil good, woe right. unto you, you will, you will be destroyed, you shall fall on the wrath of God, and so on. But when we get to chapter 6, right. the tone of this prophet changes. changes. And I'm saying this because we are talking about God's mission being my mission. my mission. We see that God's mission is now Isaiah's mission. He now embraces this mission. And what makes him embrace this mission is not something that happens out of the blues. It's something that God actually plans to do to an experience that God gives him. So the opening of chapter 6 from verse 1, we see Isaiah um, seeing a vision of heaven. And God takes him into the heavenly sanctuary. And he sees cherubims and seraphims. He sees angels mighty, you know, flapping their wings around the throne of grace. And the beauty of that description cannot be overemphasized. Yes. And, and it's actually not just beautiful, it's also scary to imagine. Because some of these angels, he said, had I don't know how many eyes all over their heads. They had how many wings and they were flapping and, and they were always saying holy, holy, holy. And he sees that there's a, a furnace of fire somewhere. And one of the angels... In, these angels actually are burning fires. They are like, they are flames. Of, this angel is made of flames. And even though this angel is made of flame, he cannot pick fire from that, from that uh, coal, a burning coal from that furnace yes. with his bare hands. Right. He has to use a tongue, yes. you know, to, 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 pick, to pick the angel, I mean, to pick the, the fire. Right. This is a very figurative, uh, you know, vision. It has a lot that we can talk about. But that is at that point is when Isaiah now hears the voice saying from the throne of God, who shall go for us, for us. and who shall we send? Yes. And then Isaiah and then, answered. And then now he answered, here am I. You know, before he gives that answer, God had to humble him. Right. God had to show him who God really is. God had to show him how the angels of heaven serve him. God had to show him how mighty he is and, and how worthless or helpless Isaiah is, on the other hand, before he could have a, my, a change of mindset. And I started by saying from chapter 1 to chapter 5, Isaiah is very accusative in the way he talks. Yes. And, and, and before we get to the point where we are so humbled, we are so, like, can I say, contrite, because the Bible, the book of Psalms says, a contrite spirit the Lord will not reject. Before we get to that, you know, broken and contrite spirit mm -hmm. state, right. then we are not ready to go. Absolutely. The person who is ready to go is not the chest-thumping Isaiah who is accusing the daughters of Zion with many accusations. Right. The person who is ready to go is the Isaiah, the one that we see in chapter 6. Yes. The one who is already humbled and he and, and, you know, the Bible says that the, the Lord put his word in his mouth. Yes. At, until we get to that point, we are not ready to go. So what I get from there is that the Lord actually wants someone to go. Absolutely. And when he say, who will go for us? Absolutely. The other time we see God talking in plural is when he says, now let us make man in our own image. Yes. Now, who will go for us 
is going not for the angels, yeah. but for the Godhead. Yes. Because this is God's mission. So when we go, we are going for Christ, for God the Father, and for God the Holy Spirit, who will go for us. Absolutely. Amen. And I, Amen. I really thank you for that, for, mm. for, for really putting this into context as we uh, get into uh, this great lesson, uh, mercy. Mm. And then we realize uh, something from um, the sentiments that um, Morris had given, that um, there was a sense of urgency. Mm. Uh, in this voice, because I heard a voice of the Lord saying, mm. whom shall I send? Mm. There is no particular time that God will seek uh, in, uh, in, 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 in very earnest and very urgent terms mm. to send someone. Mm. And this was such a time as mm. that, mm. isn't it? Yes, uh, indeed. It was such a time that God wanted someone to be used of him. Right. And here we see prophet Isaiah leaving everything and accepting to be used of God assignment because right. we know that mission is of God and we are just partnering with God on his mission and on his work. So prophet Isaiah here is coming up and saying, here I am, Lord, send me. It's such a humbling statement and uh, I wish it would be found of us too that wherever we are called upon, may we be ready to say that here I am, Lord, send me. And uh, what I get from here is that unlike Abraham who agreed to be sent and to be used of God, we see also Jonah. Yes. Yeah, Jonah is another content uh, character here who comes in and uh, he's not ready. He's not ready. He tries to run away from God. But what catches my attention is that we can never run away from God. That we are, no matter where we go, no matter where we run to, God is everywhere. Yeah, God yeah. is everywhere. We cannot run away from God. Neither can we run away from God's work. Absolutely. So this God work is there with us, is here with us, and we just have to be humble enough and just to accept the call mm. that God is making unto us that mm. go of going out and taking the message unto his all a, entire kingdom because this is his desire that every man... Sorry. Yeah, and, and, and you see, we are dealing with the analogy yes. of, of uh, Abraham. Still, we, we, we must go back to Abraham somehow. Mm. We must go back to Abraham as a guy who set uh, some standard in response to mission. Mm. Um, but as to Jonah and the burden of Nineveh that was uh, upon him, and, and I think I would like us to, to, read, uh, to read the book of, uh, of Jonah. One to, one to four. Just allow me to read so that we place this into context. That he says that now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Verse 3 says, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of of the Lord. I underline the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tashis. So he paid the fare and went down into, into it to go, to, uh, to go with them to Tashis from the presence of the Lord. Again, the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind and the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Now, um, uh, appeal. That is where we begin this discussion. Yes. About the mission and about those who are willing to go on mission and the excuses that we give. Uh, how do you contextualize this? Yes, I see a God who is uh, sending us out to go on a mission. And uh, in the mission field, it's always going to be very hard it's never easy. There is a hymn writer who says that, you know, uh, when we go out, going forth with weeping, you know. Right. And there are so many losses we sustain in the course of the work. So the work, even from the very beginning, uh, it's, it's hard enough, you know, even responding to the call. We see Jonah knows that it is the voice of the Lord, but then he's, he, he feels that, you know, when God says, whom shall I send? There are so many of us who find it very convenient and very easy to actually say that, you know, here I am, but send them. We do not want to actually go. We do not personalize that call. Right. And for Jonah himself, you know, God is calling him to go to Nineveh. And Nineveh is not, it's not just a, an easy place to go to. 
and and for us sometimes even when you are called and we are we are being told to go speak to our friends we are being told to go speak to you know the people who know us very well and we find it it is not very convenient for us to go and and just looking at it you know just building the context for the call to go to Nineveh when you read the book of second chronicles i'll just read uh, chapter 32 uh, starting from uh, verse verse 10 it talks about you know the assyrians right. and uh, we are told in verse 9 after this did senekarib king of assyria send his servants to jerusalem but he himself laid siege against lashish and all his power with him and to Hezekiah king of Judah and unto all Judah that were at Jerusalem saying thus says the Nekarib king of Assyria whereupon do you trust that you abide in the siege in yes. Jerusalem yes does not Hezekiah persuade you to give over yourself to die by you, by famine and by thirst saying the lord our god shall deliver us out of the hand of the king of Assyria has not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem saying he shall worship before one altar and burn incense upon it know ye not what i and my fathers have done unto all the people of other lands were the gods of the nations of those lands are in any ways able to deliver them out of my hand who was there among all the gods of those people those nations that my father utterly destroyed that could deliver his people out of my hand that your god should be able to deliver you out of my my hand Now therefore let not Ezekiah deceive you nor persuade you uh, on this manner neither yet believe him for no god of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of the hand of my out, out of the hand of my fathers how much less shall your god deliver you out of my hand and so this is a king who is you know uh, just stamping and he's telling him that you know we are the superpowers you better tow the line and Jonah is being given the call to go to these people these people that don't respect God and to preach to them you know the message of repentance and from the word go Jonah is like i don't think god you're sending me to the right people i don't think you understand the people you're sending me to and it takes us back to the story of you know Cornelius when uh, god told him to go and minister to Paul right. and he tells god you do not know what this man has done mm. to the church right and 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 we see Jonah you know we, we might say that Jonah was 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 not going after what God wanted him to do right. but i think we find also ourselves in so many such situations where god is sending us to a people that we feel it would be a waste of our time it would be a waste of our energy to even speak to them they will not even listen to the message that we are going out with to them yes because we have weighed them on our own scales yes and we have judged them and we have finished their judgment and we have said that they are beyond redemption you know uh, these are guys who are past uh, the bounds of grace of yes. god and and so uh, and probably that was the conclusion of jonah uh, you know having heard of nineveh uh, because you, you know it, it's really it's really interesting um when we go back to that verse because because god is saying that the weakness the wickedness has come up to me so he's not telling him that you're just going to normal people he is going in to a crazy people who sins as and wickedness has come even before 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 the lord and i guess jonah is uh, morris jonah is looking at himself as saying hey okay so god if these guys are so wicked to the point that it has even come to you then who am i that i should go to them right yeah, yeah. you know it is one thing to be to be a powerful nation right but it's a different ball game to be both powerful and wicked and wicked yes <laughs> can you imagine yeah. wickedness so and power you are powerful Brain, yeah. but you are also very wicked yes that's a dangerous combination <laughs> to be found <laughs> very distressing <laughs> to be found in, very distressing to be found in a nation and I like i was about to read that text that uh, uh, brother apio has read and i was just smiling and he was going through it I, i like the way the holy spirit works right. so we not read it but you can imagine how senacherib was just thumping and asking uh, right. these emissaries that were sent by uh, uh, hezekiah where are these nations where is so and so king of so and so yes. where, where are they yes. they tried yes. but they failed do you also want to go to the same fate the road, yes and yeah. jonah must have been keen on following the wickedness of this nation 
And, and, and you know, when we look at the wickedness of, of, uh, of uh, Nineveh, I can only equate it to that of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, Gomorrah, which we studied last week. Right. Yeah. But also uh, that of the antediluvian period during yes. the time of Noah. Yes. Because the, the, the wickedness is described as it was so great. It was a center of crime and wickedness. But they were also the capital city of Assyria and they were the most powerful nation. Yes. So we, we, humanly speaking, we understand the fear of Jonah. All right, but divinely speaking, we know that uh, fear is just an excuse because elsewhere in the Bible that we are told that we have not been called to the spirit of fear, but yeah. that of power oh. and of a sound oh. mind in Jesus Christ. Christ. Amen. 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 So this was a prophet. You know what baffles me is that this was actually a prophet of God. Yeah. <laughs> he was a prophet. He was not like a, a normal person. He was not like any other. Uh, Israelite around along the streets. No, he was a prophet. Yes. And elsewhere, I think in in one of the chronicles, we see how God had used Jonah before. Yes. This was not the first time that God was using him. Right. But for some reason, the enemy or the devil allowed him to magnify the fear. So sometimes when we are called to to go into these dangerous zones, I've, I'm part of a ministry, and sometimes we we go into the streets of uh, mostly in but in my backyard where I come from. And there's the capital city of Nyanza, you know which city it is. <laughs> Sometimes we go along those streets and we have to meet people who use drugs, people who are into various uh, activities like crime and so on. And there are some dungeons that you have to percolate and just literally walk and go in there. Mm. And you don't even want to... Mm. to if you allow the, the slight thought of you being safe or unsafe to... To, to, me, to measure in your mind, then you will definitely not go. And you, you feel a sense of danger, even as you walk in those streets, even as you try to wade your way around the, the places, even if it's at bro, broad daylight. Yeah, yeah, in bro still you still just feel a sense of danger. So that if God really is not holding your hand, and if you're not entrusting your life and your mission unto God, then you cannot go. You can find yourself in the place of Jonah, or giving excuses of fear. Yes, and you know, for for Jonah and the uh, biblical account that we are given in Jonah is that Nineveh was exceedingly wicked city, and I guess he must have uh, weighed it and say, and first of all, which other prophet have been sent there? And so for him, it was uncharted waters, mercy. Like like, hey, you, it's like being sent into probably China or Russia right now, and being told, hey, uh, you, and then you think to yourself. By the way, which other Seventh Day Adventist pastor has, has, has ever been sent to uh, to, to, to dip in, uh, in 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 China or in communist communist China then uh, during the time of Mao Zedong? So, what what do we know about God uh, sending us to places where He has sent no one before? Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed, God is uh, is God want to use us to go to the entire world. We realize that our mission field is to the entire world. So as you are asking, we can even be sent to China. And uh, what we need to know is that uh, God is going to avail everything possible for us to be, to reach there and Absolutely. to go on his work Absolutely. and on his herds. So we should not fear. And uh, we need to know that uh, God is in control because... Uh, Again, this is his, his work, and uh, we, are just, uh, we are just being used of him. So let us allow the Holy Spirit to guide us always and uh, not to be afraid of anything because we know that when God is for us now, who can be against us? There is no one for sure. There is no one who can uh, So indeed, uh, our God is on our side, and uh, let us go out and just to evangelize because the work is uh, is much outside here. Yes. Yeah, I also want to add in something. You know, when David talks to us in the Psalm, uh, that is Psalm 23, he actually acknowledges that fear is something that is it's real. real. Yes. It is not imaginary. Yes. He says in verse 4 that, yeah, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Yeah. He acknowledges that fear will always be there. And, and any of us can fear, you know, when we're going to, to do the work. You remember the story of uh, Elijah after demonstrating such great power at Mount Carmel. Yes, yes, yes. 
And then uh, Jezebel told him, you know, in uh, First Kings chapter 19, uh, verses 1 to 4. And he said that, you know, the same thing you've done to the prophets of the Lord. I'm coming to do That it. is what I will do it to you. Yeah. And we see him being gripped by fear and running away. And he's, he's telling God that, you know what, God, you'd rather, I would rather die at this, at this time. And fear is something that is real. But then we need to remember the words of Ezekiah. I just want us to read from the book of uh, uh, Second Chronicles, the same uh, Chronicles that we, we read, uh, chapter 32, and the verse is uh, 7. This is what Ezekiah tells uh, the people of God. He tells them, be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there will be more with us than with him. Mm-hmm. And I think for all of us who are going out uh, to do you know, God's work, fear will always be something that, uh, that is real. And there will be circumstances that will make us to, you know, to fear for our lives. But God is telling us that he that is with us is more than they that is, that, that is with them. Perhaps you need to mention, uh, Brother Pio, sorry, moderator. Yes, you go ahead. Verse go ahead. 8, yeah? Yes. That they are not just more with us, but the people or those who are with us are actually different yes. from those who are with them. That's yes. very key. Yes, Listen yes. to verse 8. It says, with him is an arm of flesh, flesh. but with us, us is, the, is Lord, the Lord our, our God, God to help us and, and to fight, fight our, our battles. battles. Our battles. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and you know, when we come to focus then on, on, on those excuses and, and we look at it and we, we, we boil down to the analysis of why a prophet of God, John, the son of Amitai, and a God calls him and, and he could not stand to the occasion. So he, he begins to take it, uh, you know, his mind becomes hyperactive somehow. And he imagines that, um, hey, uh, will I really be safe? Will, uh, will, will these, um, you know, uh, Ninevites, will they even invite me? And you see, uh, it's, it's, not even, it's, it's not even him, but it is the message that he bears. Yeah, because he's saying that go cry against them. Yeah, go tell them. Go point out to them that they are all wrong, they have been weighed on the scales, and they have been found that their wickedness has come before God, and you are the man to speak to them about it. What earlier uh, Brother Morris was saying, that it's not just, it's not just any other nation. It is the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, it is not any other place. It is communist uh, North Korea. You know, and you have to go in there, and then you imagine that, hey, this is North Korea? Are you kidding me? Is it really what, what you want me, God? So sometime, uh, and Masi, I'm just, um, just trying to break it. I'm not finding the correct words. I- I'm just trying to say that uh, when we internalize um, the implication of this mission, and when we look it against ourselves, we then realize, oh, will I really be able to do it? And, and, and so the excuses that come, uh, how do you, how, how, how does it uh, come out to you um, yeah. in this drama? Yeah, when John? we look at ourselves on our, with our own nature and on our own strength, we shall say that uh, I'm not able to go to it. Right. But when we realize that all these are false views and uh, we need to know that uh, the one who has sent us is strong and uh, we are going to know that even going out there, it takes the hand of God. And uh, we know that we cannot do so many things on our own. So it, it just takes us back to the strength that comes from God, that uh, we will be able to go out, not on our own, but uh, by God guiding us. And let us not uh, judge. Let us not judge ourselves or judge our friends or see like uh, they cannot make it, or I will not do it. Let us ask the strength from above, and indeed, we shall do it. You know, and, 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 and this, this particular lesson is talking about excuses. 
our own excuses, our own ability to try and justify circumstances appeal yes. that, that is around us based on our own judgment, not based or not on the account of what God has done uh, or how God, has, how God has used us before, but on the account that we, we, we fear the unknown. Uh, and yet we, we are servants of a God who has done before extremely, exceedingly, uh, beyond what we ever really comprehended, uh, isn't it? Yes. You know, uh, Ellen White tells us that we have nothing to fear for the future. Right. Unless we shall forget, you know, how God has guided us in the past. In, in, in the past, and, yes. And for me, I just have uh, a personal testimony from uh, a time when I was in campus. And I was the prophecy speaker. And the place where we went to minister in was a strongly Catholic place. Right. And there's no way you can preach prophecy, you know, without mentioning the Pope, especially towards the end of the, of the meeting. And I remember on the first day when we were going for door-to-door, uh, the elder of the church said that uh, two weeks ago we had a crusade here and two young men were arrested because they mentioned the Pope uh, <laughs> in, the, in the course of their, of their speaking. And so the elder was sort of like telling me that if you mention the Pope, uh, then be sure you're that you're going to get, to, to get into trouble. And I remember that week when I was trying to get to that uh, sharing on, uh, on, uh, on, on the papacy, when I was getting into Daniel 7, the day that I was to introduce that topic, I remember dividing Daniel 7 into three parts so that I could delay. And, I, and, and some of the missionaries were making fun of me, telling me that uh, just have a good lunch because tonight you're going to spend uh, in the prison cells. And I remember I was so tensed on that particular day. And, and I even thought of you know, hiding some of the slides that I was going to use for my presentation. But that morning, during the devotion, someone shared from the book of Acts and, and these are the verses that he read. This is Acts 20. And uh, Paul here tells us from verse 18. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the laying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and I've taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnessing uh, in every city, saying that bonds and affliction abide me. But Paul goes ahead and says, but none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear, and to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. Amen. That Amen. morning, I think it was the Lord speaking to me. And I went in there and I introduced that topic and I preached on it. And I felt that the Lord had spoken to me powerfully through those verses. And Paul saying that, you know, none of these things move me. And so it's just a call to us, you know, as we go out there. There will be circumstances when we actually see ourselves in danger, but we just need to trust and we need to put our lives unto God. You know, even though our lives are in jeopardy, but then we shall still trust that the Lord will strengthen, will strengthen us. us. Yes. yes. Yeah. And you know, Maurice, fundamentally, in the book of, uh, of Jonah, we see a God, uh, and, and we see probably that, that, that Jonah... Uh, really had a very interesting picture of God, a God who takes no for an answer. Mm -hmm. That, uh, you know, I can just say no. It is just 560 uh, kilometers out of, uh, miles out of um, uh, Jerusalem. But I can go as far as possible, as far away as possible from you, God. And, and, and so I, I just want us to continue to put this into a little bit of context so that we draw a lesson or two about the dealings of God uh, and Jonah uh, at that very moment when he is not heading to Nineveh, but the opposite direction to, to Tarshish. Thank you. Um, God does not make, uh, give us a vision without a provision. Absolutely. Every vision that he gives us is accompanied by providence provision, yes. or provision. Yes. And he leaps. Um, 
I don't know how to put this, but a lot of times we are called to serve, but we we give excuses that look like real good reasons because they are facts. We just point to facts. In the case of Jonah, it was it was factual that these people were dangerous. It was also true that they were the superpower. But it's also very true that they were very wicked. And perhaps there could have been some, in the case like in the case of our brother Pio, maybe that was the experience of Jonah too, that right. there may have been some missionaries who had been sent to Nineveh and they didn't come back, you know. So who was he, uh, you know, who was God? Why was God daring him to go? But if we just take God at his word, we have known and we have, the Bible is replete with examples right. where those who dared to take God at his word never failed. One of them was um, Daniel, who was thrown in the lion's den. And an angel of God went before him. Before he, was, before he could land into the den, the angel of God was already there and shut the mouth of all those, all those uh, uh, lions. So um, it is true that uh, we are not called in, in times of ease. Um, uh, elsewhere, I don't know, is it Jeremiah? He says that if you, are not, if you have not been able to run with the footmen, shall you be able to run with the horsemen? Mm-hmm. And, if, mm-hmm. and if in the land of ease where you're just, uh, you know, having a lot of good time, you cannot do this work, can you be able to contend with the swelling of Jordan? You know, mm-hmm. we are not called in times, in times as such as this to just sit and relax. As a matter of fact, some of us in the mission field, we love to lose our lives. Absolutely. All right? Mm. That's, that's a fact. Some of us, we love to sustain some injuries, just like Paul. Mm. He sustained several injuries, neck bites, uh, beatings in the prison cells, you know, sicknesses. He had a thorn in the flesh that he talks about in Second Corinthians. Yeah. Three times he pleaded with God, please take this thing away. God tells him, your, my grace is sufficient for you. Yes. We don't know what that thorn is. Some yes. say it was a poor vision. Others say it was trembling hands. Whatever it was, this man had actually suffered a lot. And actually, when he was being called, he was told, you must suffer many things at the calling of Paul when he was being converted. Right. And th- that, that is what we are called to do. So uh, as a missionary, when you're going out, you need to have that mind that I'm not going out to safety. But God is going to be with me. There's likelihood that I might lose my life as a martyr. That's fine. If God appoints that to be my Lord, then let his name be glorified. Amen. But we trust him nonetheless. Amen. Yes. And, 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 and fundamentally, again, we speak uh, to near-death experiences where, where, where Jonah, the stakes are so high concerning Nineveh. And, um, and for salvation of men and salvation really to come to people is always a near-death experience in that if you are to be taken to the belly of a whale mm-hmm. and, be, and, and be transformed or, or uh, in the process so that you are strengthened in the process because God is not also just sending you to those people but also trying to save you as well, the, 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 the missionary. And I get that sense when, I, when, when, when we come to, uh, to concretize really um, the, the concept of Jonah, that, that God, uh, uh, um, you know, mercy will, will, will say, okay, I will send you. I realize that there is weakness in you. You know, I, I have realized that you have looked at it and taken it around your mind and you have actually arrived at a conclusion that I am not worth. I am not strong enough for this mission. But nevertheless, I will send you. Yeah. Even if I have to transport you via the belly of a whale, <laughs> you know, I will, I, I, will, I will make you go there. Because in the process of me taking you there, mm-hmm. I am also saving you. Mm-hmm. And my grace is also becoming sufficient, sufficient. for you mm-hmm. for that mission, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. Indeed, God's grace is always sufficient for us. That even these challenges that we are foreseeing on our mission field, as uh, my brother Maurice has said, that we need to be ready, even if it reaches a point of us our lives being taken away for the sake of other souls. This is so interesting because God's grace is sufficient unto us and uh, he will strengthen us. He has promised that he's going to go with us and is with us on this mission field. And so even uh, as we walk along the Christian journey, we even get more strength and we get more encouraged because uh, we are on a journey. And uh, this journey of Christianity, the challenges for sure are there. We have been assured of them, but uh, we are going to come conquerors because even Christ himself overcame. 
So let us continue to look down up on Christ, who is the author and the finisher of our lives, and is the greatest example that we have, even on this mission field, that as we continue to conquer, and as we continue to move along, and even as to continue to go to the far end of this world, spreading the good news, let us know that Christ is with us. Absolutely. Yeah, and also something else would be that, you know, when we start promise that he will be with us uh, even to the end of the of the age. And uh, we see Jonah, you know, he's trying to run away from the presence of God. But that is a very wrong view, you know, for anyone who is in the mission of God. Because God is telling us that, you know, I will be with you in all the places that you go. It's the same promise that God made to Jacob when you read the book of uh, uh, Genesis 28, right. where God tells Jacob in uh, verse 15, that, and behold, I am with you and will keep you in all the places where you go and will bring you again into this land. For I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to you. To you. Jacob going away from uh, the God of his father, he actually thought that he was, he was a runaway you know, from God. He was a fugitive from the Lord of his father. But God is promising him that he will be with him. And we see God making a covenant that day with Jacob. And Jacob says that, you know, and if the Lord is with me and he will keep me in the way that I go, then he says, when I come back again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And so Jonah himself trying to run away from the presence of God, but God is still telling him that wherever you go, I'm going to be there with you. And you can, we cannot run away from the presence of God when God calls us to the mission. Absolutely. And there are sometimes, Maurice, very, very, very uncomfortable confrontations in, in, in the missions. In the sense that we are sent to missions, and in these missions that we are sent to, we, th th there is going to be conversation. I like what uh, Brother Pio alluded to earlier that there are sometimes that you are inside you, you are very uncomfortable with the burden that you are bearing yourself. And, and, and he meant to bring it out, I guess, uh, and he brought it out very well, I think, that um, sometimes this message is very uncomfortable, very unpalatable, even in our view, in our judgment. But we have to deliver it anyway. Mm -hmm. And so we see Jonah telling God, eh, I told you this. You know, I, 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 when the response was not very pleasant, when, when I was still up there before you brought me here via transport of a well, I, I, I told you these things. You know, how do we, how do we speak to that? Uh, comfortable situations. God sometimes confronts us. Absolutely. You know, in, and, and, and that, that's why I like that title, Uncomfortable Confrontations. Yes. Because... Um, in our sleep or in our spiritual slumber as missionaries, God shakes us awake vigorously. Amen. So for Jonah's case, he was shaken. His confrontation was, I think I can single out two. One was his experience in the belly of that whale. Yeah. And um, he was so humbled. You can imagine this prayer of Jonah. Is it in Jonah chapter 4 or yeah, 3? Yeah. That's a dream. That's a dream, yeah. <laughs> I think it's true. Where, where he, he prayed pray, in. He yeah. prays with a lot of humility. He, he, he is down to earth. And you wonder, is this the same Jonah who was running away from the presence of God? So sometimes God, sometimes God, God gives us those uncomfortable confrontations to wake us up. But even after going to finally reaching Nineveh, you know, he starts preaching. And he had so much hatred for these people. Right. <laughs> he he even wished, attitude, he wished he would die than to <laughs> even go and preach to them. Yeah. Or than to live to, up to the day when they will be forgiven by God. In fact, later in the book of Jonah, when God forgives these people, Jonah is, is, is really offended. You wonder what's wrong with this man because he was going to preach so that these people can, can, can uh, you know, can forsake their sin. Yes. When the king of of, of uh, Nineveh, you know, commands and says, now let everyone be in sackcloth. Yes. They, have, they have a change of mind. Let's repent for this number of days yes. so that the wrath of God, of Israel, yes. may not be upon us. Yes. Now Jonah, a missionary, yes. is now offended. Yeah. Then you wonder. But his, 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 his second confrontation was the fact that these people did not turn around immediately. So he expected that he would preach and then immediately there would be a change of, a change of heart. But then he comes and tells God, I told you when I was still in my country that these people are hard. They are not right. easy like you thought. So it's as if it's him who is now, uh, you know, advising yes. God yes. And, and advising God on, on the mission <laughs> strategy. <laughs> when I look at the story of Jonah, yeah. I see us 
I see the present day missionaries, like in verity, the, the, the life and mission of Jonah describes the present day missionaries, Kabisa, like in, in, to, the, to the very last dot. Yeah. And I think this was placed strategically for us in the Bible, for us to learn a few things and to continue to trust in the power of God. And if we go, we said last week, that if we go on mission, we must have love. Absolutely. The love of Abraham. Absolutely. If we are devoid of that love, then we are worse than Jonah. Absolutely. True. And, and you know, we, we, and you know Apio, yes. uh, just, uh, just, just, just before you, you, you make that comment, he, he, there are bullies around. You know, there are they, these, they, these people who present to us this image that these ones uh, cannot be converted, like that king. Mm-hmm. And, and it, it actually must have shocked John that, that oh, so uh, this guy can is actually, actually is actually convertible is is preachable <laughs> you know this guy is actually able to listen and so the entire thing that god has gone ahead of us has never really registered to us uh, until we internalize that and come to the conclusion that god is always ahead of us working Amen. our working our salvation Amen. or working in our missions uh, isn't it isn't yeah, it up here? Yes, you see, I think when we go out to do the work, sometimes we we want to, we feel happy when we scrub people with the message. Right. You know, when we when we speak a word that, you know, like shakes them, that is what makes us happy. But we are forgetting, we are forgetting the essence of what God wants us to do. And, and I just see a story in the book of Luke 9, where we are told in verse, uh, verse 52, and we are, we are told that, And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messengers before his face and went and entered into a village uh, of of Samaria. And then we are told uh, that they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, why will you not command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? And he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And, and, and that, is, you know, that is the same spirit that God wants us to have even as we reach out to souls. We are supposed to remember that God is out to seek. And when he's seeking, he will receive, you know, he will get those that are actually not ready to be harvested now. And he wants to be. He wants us to be patient with even those that we reach out to, and he wants us to have that, you know, that love as we reach out to these people that we might win some. Mm-hmm. Paul says, you know, he's he's been forced to become everything yes. it, for, for him, all men for him, that, that he, he might, might win some. Win some. Yeah, yeah, and and so for us as well, when we go out there, let's remember that it is for the souls that we are laboring for. And it is not just, you know, for us to see God's retribution come to them, but that every man might be saved. Come to salvation. And for our online um, audience, we are focusing on these excuses to mission and examining the response of Jonah in, in respect to Isaiah's response. And, um, and we are focusing uh, rather deeply on how our response is especially uh, to mission that we face uh, at this time uh, in, 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 in the life of the church or in the ministry of the church at this point in time where we are saying that I will, I will go. And this is the, this is the message uh, central to our, our, our mission uh, right here. And I wanted just, uh, Marcy, to, uh, to step back for one second and say that uh, for Jonah, um, he chose the path of low resistance. You know, we want to choose this path. I mean, it's easier to just go down to, uh, to Tashis and uh, by the beach there, hang and reflect upon, upon this and, um, and, and, and see whether this can be settled, whether God can settle that with himself, uh, forgetting that he is part of God's, of God's mission. And it happens even in church today that others would sit back when we say, uh, Morris, we are going to the ghettos that you are saying deep down in our, in, in, in our cities, and some of us just sit back and say, uh, you know, uh, that is for go. Apio yes. and, uh, and the rest of the folk who, <laughs> who can go, to, isn't it? Yeah. We sit back. Yeah, we sit back. And many a times uh, we are even victims. Uh, just uh, a few months ago, we were being called upon to go for a mission. Yeah, with the with the sister, 
Yes. The, the sisters? Mary. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, not many of us were ready to go or available to go. So let us not be resistant. And uh, we know that God has gone ahead of us. And uh, we can be running away from God or we run towards God. So where are you? Are you running towards God to be used to say like Prophet Isaiah said that, here I am, Lord, send me. Or we want to run away from God like Jonah. And, le- and yet God is looking for us. So may we be challenged and may we know that we can either run towards God or we can or run, run away, away, from, away God. from God. Mm-hmm. Some years back, they sent us to some place in Kisi. <laughs> and, you know, and it was a camping. And, uh, and the first thing they told us is that there are going to be guys who will be running and they will be having fire and you will not even sleep. And, they were, uh, and, and you know, for the first time, I, I when <laughs> these guys were like, uh, guys, if you are not ready for this mission, please don't go. Because this is this is bad, as, as, as it were. And I remember sitting to myself and saying, an experience with a night runner is not something I want to, uh, to go through at this point in time. And I remember that mission was the mission that was attended by the most few members uh, out of that core team that we had then. But, but it speaks to our fears. It speaks to our own human interpretation and, and how we bring out um, uh, our, our weaknesses, even before a great God who calls us to boldness because he has gone ahead of us, uh, Brother, um, Brother Morris. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it, it, start, it starts from the, the place of trusting God. Right. And, and, uh, and then, two, loving that night runner. <laughs> loving the night runner. Yes. There you go. Because <laughs> because because Jonah did not love the Ninevites. Absolutely. For he him, he them. was condemning. In fact, look at his speech to the Ninevites. He said, "Unto forty days, and this city will be destroyed." Dest- destroyed. Forty yeah. count yeah. with me. Yeah, forty, yeah. 40 yeah. days, one two. In fact, on the second day, he must have been saying. 39 days, and <laughs> he could not wait to see. He set his clock. Yeah. He could not wait down. to see the destruction of this city. He could not wait for that movie sitting down somewhere, and he wanted Nineveh to be the second Sodom and Gomorrah. Right. And he wanted to see, like Abraham watched, you know, fire coming down from heaven and, and consuming this city. So, it, it never, so, so what will drive you? What should actually drive you to the mission field? Is the love for the souls that you're going to save. Absolutely. Because Christ had compassion of them. You know, you know, you know, you know, the Bible says that Christ looked at the multitude and he had compassion on them. Amen. He saw the way they were running to and fro, the way they, they, they were hungry, not just thirsting for the physical food, but also for the spiritual, you know, life-giving yes. food. And Christ had compassion. Of, if we can have that compassion of Christ on the souls that are languishing in sin, that are getting lost daily and edging closer to their eternal destruction. If we can know the magnitude of, you know, of, 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 of help mm. that God is, is, is intending to give those people through us. And if we can also appreciate that this mission is not ours to be personalized, yes. so that I do it as Morris in my own style, yeah. but we use God's method. It is God's mission first. Before it's my mission. Before it's our mission. So, so I think that is one missing piece that I, was there with Jonah and is still there with us. Today. I like the way you've yeah. uh, brought it out. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. We, we, we are agents who are ready to serve God. And uh, even as our online community breaks this down to us, we realize that uh, the only valid response that we have to give is that here am I sent me. And it is not an easy response, as, 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 as it were, because it took an angel picking a, a fire, live fire, uh, from Cole and saying, and putting it, and touching it on, 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 on the prophet Isaiah, uh, so, that, so that the message bore the clarity that, that it deserved, because who will go for us? Uh, and I think, uh, um, Mercy, when we come to think about the response of Isaiah, we look at ourselves and we say, are we really able to do it like mm-hmm. Isaiah? Yeah, it is a question that is being posed unto each and every one of us. Are we ready? And uh, are we willing? The songwriter, song number 359 by Daniel March, 
He's saying, Hark the voice of Jesus calling. calling. Yes. Hark the voice, stanza one says, Hark the voice of Jesus calling. Who will go and walk today? Fields are white, the harvest waiting. Who will bear the sheaves away? Loud and long, the master called it. Rich reward, he offers free. Who will answer gladly, saying, Here am I, O Lord, send me. Will you be able to say, Here I am, Lord, send me? And you know, uh, that is a very good part of you. To, uh, to bring this together, that there are excuses to the mission, yes. and there is a response, and there is what God wants us to do, even him recognizing that there are weaknesses to us, so as he can take us a step to say that, here I am, Lord, send me, isn't it? As we just do one round of, uh, you know, uh, touch points that we should take away from this lesson. Yeah, the call to mission is going to cost us a lot, not only, uh, you know, in our time, but also even in our finances. And so it calls us to be, you know, uh, be willing to be used and to be spent in the cause of God. But also something else that we also forget, even as we are having these uncomfortable confrontations, is that we should have Christian prudence. You know, there are people who go out there, you know, like uh, seeking to, to gender opposition. Uh, there are people who, who, who are going out to start other, you know, like elements for revenge and all that but God is not calling us to do things that will hinder the spread of the gospel he wants us to be humble he wants us to be willing to be spent and to be used as servants amen. together with God amen thank you so much um, uh, I think what what uh, brother said is, is is very pertinent because um, some people go for mission uh, uh, you, you would think they are on a mission for God yes. but they are actually on a revenge mission um, and they're on a mission to prove a point. Right. That's why I have never, personally, this is my personal opinion, I have never loved the approach of public debates, you know, yes. where a certain faction of, of, of uh, say, uh, yeah, a certain belief system comes, and then us Christians or Adventists, we also come, and then now we prove from our various books why ours is the right faith, and, <laughs> and, and so on. Yeah, and and the at right. the end of the day, you yeah. know, they win converts from us, and, and we were hoping to win converts from them. And then you wonder, oh, what was the end game of this? Mm. We are not on a revenge mission, we are not on, on a, a mission. mission, we are not on a mission to prove a point, but we are on God's mission to Amen. save souls for Amen. eternity. Amen. Yes. Amen. Mercy. Yes, indeed, uh, we have a call just to adhere to God's mission and uh, God is ready to work with us and to walk with us. So let us avoid many excuses and be ready to be used of God because he has promised to be with us till the end of it all. Amen. Amen. And that's a good part to conclude this lesson. That where for God has given us an opportunity to serve, we may have our own little excuses, but the grace of God has gone ahead of us. And our mission is not just to position this brand of theology, uh, the Seventh-day Adventist, but for us to be able to understand that there are souls who are in need of salvation, and we are under obligation not to give, you know, we are under obligation to bring them to salvation like the song had said. So I want to thank you so much for, 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 for blessing us this morning and giving us an opportunity to, to be able to break this down, um, that God's mission is our mission indeed. And we will continue again next week with that same, same line of thought, our thematic area of God's mission, our mission. And I would then like, uh, you know, we would like to hear from our audience um, online, uh, you know, to help us to contribute and to help us to again uh, react to uh, some of the lessons that we are picking up from this lesson. And so I just want to invite us for a word of prayer as we conclude this lesson. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that the reflection of this moment has been about our response to mission that you have bestowed upon us. That like a prophet Isaiah, our response will be, here I am, 
Lord sent me. And Lord, we reckon that by participating in this mission, we are participating in a moment that you will give us grace, and that grace will carry us through to the day that God you will appear when there shall be a rapture in the silver lining of the cloud, and we shall see you. And so we pray for every saint who is in mission right now. We pray for the mission of the church globally, and we pray, Lord, that, Father, you will strengthen every missionary, everyone who has taken upon this mission to carry it to the world, that you bless them and entirely give them the hope that this is, all, this is not all in vain. Bless us to that extent that you are God and prepare us again for another great lesson about your mission for we pray, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.